Good morning. You guys ready to practice? Mel, it's good to see you. Where's Brian? Brian, welcome back. Uh, good seeing some guys who haven't been here in a while. But guys, when we practice, when we come and we train as your leader, my job is to, to push you spiritually. My job as the leader of practice is to push you to memorize scripture, to study, to sign up for a Tuesday night discipleship class, to do something more than just Saturday morning. My job is to warn you, and that's what we're going to talk about today over these next couple of weeks. We're going to warn you about Satan's bait. Satan, what, what does he dangle out there in front of you, that shiny object that us men that we just chomp on? What is that hook? And we're going to talk about that today. You see that in your notes where the bait of Satan, uh, week one, we're going to talk about guilt, shame, and regret. And this, is, this has been difficult. I did text LJ and a couple other guys this week saying, guys, I need your prayer because what I'm going to speak on today is, is going to be difficult for some men to, to grasp and to, to understand. But we, we do have an enemy, men. We, we have an enemy that, that is doing anything and everything he can to disrupt you, to distract you, to take your mind off of Christ, to, to just completely jack you up. We have an adversary. Satan's name means adversary. Satan is seeking to devour men, devour women, devour anybody that wants to follow Christ. He is real. I put in my notes here, we should never, ever underestimate the power of Satan. But we also don't want to overestimate Satan. Does that make sense? He's real. But we don't want to give him all kinds of credit and, and, and whatnot, even though what he does, he does a good job at his, at his job, unfortunately. But we, we must not be naive, man. We must not be clueless on how he attacks us, how he puts that hook out there for us, because he always has a shiny hook waiting for men to just gobble up. And, and you, if you think about I'm not a fisherman, but if, you, if you're a fisherman, there's, there's hooks and there's lures. There's, there's all kinds of things to entice fish, right? And there's so many different ways he does it. And when we, starting with me, take that hook and we sink our teeth into it and we swallow it, and then sometimes we run, right? Because for, for me, when I sin and I, I swallow that hook, I know I'm in wrong and I do not want to repent. I do not want to go to Christ because I'm, I'm ashamed. I have guilt. I have regret. But it takes a long time for me to uh, get right with the Lord and, and repent. And it's like a fish who, who takes the bait, right? And takes off and your reel goes, right? And you're spending another hour if you're deep sea fishing, right? Reeling, reeling that fish in. And that's what we do. We, it takes hours for us to repent, sometimes days, sometimes weeks. It, it takes a long time for us to, to repent. Um, I don't think I have this in your notes, but I have a couple of things that Satan is not. Satan is not. Number one, he's not, he doesn't know everything. Uh, he, he doesn't, he doesn't, uh, uh, he's just not omniscient. He's not like God, where God knows everything. Satan is not omniscient. Satan is not omnipresent. He's not everywhere at every time. Okay. Uh, and then he's not omnipotent. He's not all powerful like, like Christ is. So Satan is not those things. Satan does not know uh, what you're thinking. Satan um, is not everywhere and he's not all powerful. What Satan is, okay, he is very observant. He watches us. He watches tendencies. It's like a coach. It's like a team. He is, he, coaches and teams, they strategize, right? They look at, they have a scouting report, okay? The Packers are scouting the Niners. The Niners are scouting the Packers. The Bills are scouting the Chiefs. They're sitting in rooms and they're like, what are the tendencies of this, these teams? What do they do? That's what Satan does with us. He says, Chris, I've been watching you. Your tendency is to do this. So now I'm going to attack Chris in that area. He is going to attack Chris different than he attacks Chuck and different than he attacks Ch uh, this Chuck, Chuck and Chuck. He, he attacks us differently. Okay. He, he watches tendencies, men. 
He learned, and the last thing I have is, is as far as Satan, he learns our weakness. Oh, no, that's number two. He learns our weakness. He looks to see where we're weak, and then he will pounce. He will dangle that hook out there for us. And the last one I have is he has lots of helpers, lots of helpers. Demons are real. He will have his helpers go and attack. So there are many different things that Satan is not and that Satan is, and, and we must be um, aware of who our adversary is. So today's bait, and this is where I, when I, when I was like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to go this direction for the next four weeks. We're going to talk about the different baits that Satan has out there, many different baits, but I'm just going to tackle four of them, uh, over the next four weeks. And today is, is the, the, the bait that Satan throws in front of us of the guilt that we have, the shame that we have and the regret that we have. Because here's, here's what Satan wants to do, man. Satan wants to say, yeah, you know what? Back in the 80s, you were this type of dude. Back in the 70s, this is what you did. And you know what? You, how can you be a Christian? Look, what, look at your past, man. Look what you did. And it, seriously, you're going to go to church. You're going you're gonna to go to men's group. You're going to go in a small group. You're going to give to the church. And look, just remember what you did back in the day. And that just hampers us. It just really can set us back when we just sit and we think about the guilt and the shame and the regret that we have in our life. So I, I, I chose three examples in the Bible. In the beginning of the Bible, right, you have, um, in fact, I need a reader. I need someone to read Genesis 3, 4. So if we can get a microphone, it's a quick, short verse. But before we get there, um, real quick, who wants to be my reader for Genesis 3, 4? Steve. One minute, Steve. So in the beginning of the Bible, right? Our first, the first people, our first parents, Adam and Eve, okay? Uh, they, they walk in the garden, the first human beings. You can read about Adam and Eve in Genesis 2 and Genesis 3, where Adam and Eve were walking the garden. Everything was perfect. God basically says, okay, I have three intentions for you. God says, I'm going to love you. Uh, I need you to populate the earth, and I need you to take care of the earth. Those were the responsibilities that God gave uh, Adam and Eve to, to do that. Very few instructions. Uh, they are to enjoy the earth, and they were not to eat of one tree, right? The tree of knowledge of good and, and good and evil. But then we get to the first lie. The first lie in the Bible is Genesis 3, 4. And Steve's going to read that. And this is the first time in the Bible where deception happens. Steve, read Genesis 3, verse 4. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. One more time. Read it again. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. God told them you will die if you eat of this tree. The first lie in the Bible is right there, Genesis 3, 4, where Satan says, are you kidding me, Eve? You're not going to die. What God said is not real. His Bible is not real. You're not going to die, Eve. And Eve believed it. Eve took that bite of that hook and the apple. Actually, it's not even an apple. Some people always say it's an apple. We don't know what fruit it is. doesn't matter. Eve believed the lie, the first lie in the Bible. And she was just like, yeah, I'm not going to die. He says I won't die. We won't even talk about Adam, that lame Adam who just stood there, because he was right there and watched. Adam was not a good leader. And Adam just watched and partook of it also. That's a whole nother sermon of how weak Adam was. But Adam and Eve listened to the serpent and eventually did the very thing that God told them not to do. In that moment, Adam and Eve entered into shame and guilt. They ended up hiding, right? And, and, and I mentioned this last week, that God was walking peacefully through the garden, calling for Adam and Eve, not stomping around mad. He's peacefully walking through the garden, looking for Adam and Eve. He knew exactly where they were, but they hid themselves because they had shame and they had regret and they had guilt. So that's the very beginning of the Bible. Then let's go to the middle of the Bible where we have King David, okay, the apple of God's eye. King David seduced his friend's wife. He got her pregnant. Um, he used his power to ensure that his friend was killed in battle. The husband, what was his name? Uriah that was killed. So here he has an affair. Then he, he's starting to backpedal. He has, he has him put to the front of the line and gets killed. Okay. Uh, then Nathan confronts David about his sin. Praise God for Nathan. We need a Nathan in all of our lives. 
That's why when LJ was talking about who's the dude in your life that you can talk to about struggles and frustrations and, and victories and defeats and who can come alongside you, we need a Nathan. Nathan came to David and confronted David about his sin. David must have felt and had every reason to lie and listen to shame, but instead, David eventually end up, um, end up crying out to the Lord. You can read about David's prayer in Psalms 51. If you want to read how David was remorseful and repented, read, read Psalms 51. In fact, I have a, a quick verse here where David says in Psalms 51, he says, God, have mercy on me according to failing love. According to your great compassion, blot out all of my sin, Lord. Wash away all my iniquities and cleanse me from my sin. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew me. Give me a new spirit, David's crying for. David says, do not cast me away from your presence, Lord. Don't take your Holy Spirit away from me. Then David says, restore unto me the joy of my salvation and grant me a willing spirit and and, and heal me and restore me in Psalms 51. See, David didn't try to be innocent, men. David, when David knew he had sinned, when David knew he did wrong and he had the guilt and the shame, David was honest and, and David uh, would not allow the, the, the hook of, of guilt to, to rob him. And, and David knew he couldn't change his past, right? He, 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 had, he had the child, the child ended up dying. Uh, his friend was, was, was killed. Uh, but but David uh, prayed and, and repented and knew that that our heavenly Father could restore him and and change him just like he can restore you men and and change you. But David had guilt, shame, and regret. So in the beginning of the Bible we had Adam and Eve dealing with guilt, shame, and regret. Middle of the Bible we have David who dealt with guilt, shame, and regret. Then towards the end of the Bible we let's look at Peter. Love, love, love Peter. And when I read. Uh, John 21. John 21, Jesus already died on the cross. Peter already denied Jesus three times, and the rooster crowed three times. Peter was miserable because he made eye contact with Jesus, and Peter knew he did wrong because Jesus predicted that it, you will deny me three times before the rooster crows. And Peter was devastated. Jesus dies. Jesus is in the ground for three days. Jesus rises again. I get the goosebumps just thinking about John chapter 21 because Peter is fishing. Peter is bitter. Peter is devastated because of what he did. Then you read in John 21 where Jesus is on the Sea of Galilee and he is preparing a breakfast. They're out fishing. They come to the shore. Jesus is there. They don't recognize Jesus. They don't know it's him. Jesus has a fire lit because he's cooking the fish. When was the last time Peter made eye contact with Jesus? What was happening? Where was he? Was he around a fire? He was around, a, he was around the fire. I think that was the last time when the girl says, aren't you, aren't you his follower? And he was, it said sitting next to, um, it was probably a barrel or whatever, but he was getting warm next to a fire. And that was his third time. He said, no, I'm not, I'm not him. Then you fast forward, Jesus dies. Jesus rises again. Jesus is now on the sea of Galilee, cooking breakfast next to a fire. He makes eye contact with Peter. And I get emotional like this because guys, put yourself, put yourself in Peter's shoes. Put yourself in Peter's shoes. He is not happy. He's not doing well. Do you think Peter's dealing with regret and shame and guilt? And then Jesus looks at him and says, Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, yes, I do. Peter actually says the word, I think it's agape. No, no, no. He says, I think it's like phileo. Phileo love is like brotherly love. Jesus says, Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, I I admire you. Jesus says, do you love me? And Peter says, yes, I admire you. He says, I do love you, but Jesus knows that it's a different type of love. My whole point, men, is it is such a powerful message of Jesus showing Peter forgiveness, and and he restores Peter back into ministry. 
I love, love, love John 21 because I put myself in Peter's shoes. And it's emotional because we all have regret and shame and, and remorse. And Jesus is so forgiving. Jesus is so like wanting to restore us as he restored Peter, as he restored David, as he restored Adam and Eve. And he wants to restore you, men. And, and that guilt and shame that's going through your mind right now as I talk, whatever that is, whatever, if it happened in the 80s, if it happened yesterday, Jesus is like, man, I forgive you. I forgive you. If you've given your life to me, of course, right? If you're a child of God and you have surrendered and given your life to Christ, he says, I forgive you. Now, if you've never given your life to Christ, it's, the, the relationship is not there yet. Now, you could think about them and you could sing about them, but if you have never repented and given your life to Christ, okay, you're, it's a different category because you need to make him your savior. You need to repent and give your life to him. But those of us who have given our life to Christ and we have guilt and shame and remorse, okay, God is in the, relationship, God is in the business of restoring relationships. God's in the business of forgiving. God's in the business of complete healing and restoration. So we have guilt and shame in the beginning of the Bible. We have guilt and shame in the middle of the Bible. And then towards the end where we have Peter who has dealing with guilt and shame and Jesus um, restores, restores Peter and he wants to restore you. So that's the hook we're talking about today, men. The hook of guilt and shame, shame and regret where Satan wants to just constantly remind you of your past, constantly remind you of what you did. And you, you suck. You're no good. Why are you even going to practice? Why are you going to church? Why are you listening to that good music? Why are you meditating? Why are you memorizing scripture? Because don't you remember what you did? Don't you remember what you did? Don't you remember what you did? When Satan reminds us of our past, what we have to do is remind him of his future. Okay, because Satan's going down. So when he reminds you of your past, man, you must remind him of his future and start going back at him and telling him that you're not, you're, you're, you're crap, you're gonna die. It's over with. And then you start, you start memorizing scripture and you start voicing scripture and you start repeating scripture. That's why we memorize it here in practice, is because you have to combat the enemy with God's word. You can't just think about God, you can't just sing about him. You have to voice it. You have to say it. Isaiah 118, I, this is not in your notes, but Isaiah 118, if you are taking notes, write that down, read that. It says, come now and let us reason together, said the Lord. Though your sins may be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be like the crimson, they shall be as wool. Isaiah 118 is basically saying, yeah, I, I know what you've done and your sin is, is deep, but I have forgiven you. I have forgiven you. I want to restore you. Put here in my notes, God already knows that we have sinned, yet he pleads with us to come to him when we have sinned. He does not want us to hide or pretend. Remember, because David didn't pretend. David didn't hide. David. Now, David, I'm sure there were times that he hid, but once he came clean, he came clean and, and asked God to forgive him. So God invites us men to come to him with all of our guilt and our brokenness so that he can restore us back to how his original intentions were for us. Okay. So when we hide and when I hide, when I sin and I, I just don't want to go to God uh, and I don't want to keep going to him, um, he wants us to come to him and to address that guilt and shame because he wants to forgive us. When, when I talk about we have an adversary, and this is in your notes, in, in 2 Corinthians 2.11, in your notes there, it says, so that Satan might, outwit not, might not outwit us, for, for we are not unaware of his schemes. Satan is trying to outwit us, men. Satan is trying to, uh, to deceive us, to distract us. He is, he's conniving. He's constantly trying to get us off our game. 2 Corinthians 2.11. Then you get to 1 Peter 5, 8, 9. That's in your notes too. It says, be alert, guys. Be sober-minded. Your enemy, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Guys, we must resist him. We must stand firm in the faith because you know that your family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of suffering. That right there, man, is saying you are not alone. 
You're not alone in this struggle. You are not alone in your sin. Satan is very good at telling you you are alone. You're the only one dealing with this. You're the only one like this. And 1 Peter 5.8 is saying you're not alone. Then we get to John 10.10. The thief comes only to kill, steal, and destroy. Jesus says, I have come that they may have life, and they have it to the fullest. Then we get to Ephesians 6, which this is talking about what armor do we have to put on because of the, the, the craziness and the schemes of the devil, verses 10 through 13 there in your notes. He says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take a stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and the authorities, against the, the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day the evil comes, that you may be able to stand your ground and after you have done everything to stand. So men, right there, those three verses, uh, I'm sorry, four, four verses in your notes, just talks about how the enemy comes to pounce on us, how the enemy comes after us. And we have ton, there's, there's tons and tons of other scriptures talking about what do we have to do? What do we have to do? Not that you needed this, but in your notes, uh, there's definitions of guilt, shame, and regret. Guilt is I've done something wrong. I'm, I'm, I, 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 I was wrong. I did this. Shame is I am marred or inherently unacceptable. And then re regret is just us. Man, I just wish things were different. So Satan loves to pounce on us for guilt, shame, and regret. That's a hook that he constantly is throwing out there that you're not good enough. You suck. And, and why are you going to church? Why are you even studying? And God says, I want to use your guilt, shame, and regret. I want to use that to restore you. So guilt, shame, and regret are real. Satan, and I put here in my notes, here are the thoughts. Here's the thoughts that people, this is what we do. This is what I do. And it says, what I have done is too bad. It is too bad. I know that God has forgiven me, but I cannot be, I cannot forgive myself for this sin. Let me read that again because I kind of butchered it. What I have done is too bad. I know that God has forgiven me, but I just can't forgive myself. Here's the other thing we say. I know that God has forgiven me, but that doesn't matter. I can't forgive myself. Kind of the same thing. I just twisted it there. Man, so, so when that hook is out there and we, we, we basically just say, man, I, I can't forgive myself, we must run to God and embrace what God has done for us on the cross. We are considered new creations. Once you've given your life to Christ, men, and you have surrendered and you says, I, I, I need you to come into my life and forgive me of my sins. What you did on the cross was real and you did it for me. It becomes personal. You, you ask him and you invite him into your heart. What happens is the Holy Spirit now takes residency in you. You are a new man. You are a new creation. That's what salvation is. In 2 Corinthians 5.17, this talks about a new creation. And it says, you know, why we remember what's happened in the past, we need to believe that we are not what happened. We are not who that is. We are a new creation. For we are who God says we are. And that's what in 2 Corinthians 5.17 talks about. What happens, men, <clears throat> is the byproduct of guilt, shame, and regret uh, turns into anger and abuse and lust. And, and when we camp out there and we just say, okay, this... This guilt, the shame, this, 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 this regret turns into many different things when it's not handled right. And I've been there with anger and lust and porn because my heart wasn't right. And I've been completely uh, taken that bait and ran, even though I know God has forgiven me. I, I, I have been in those situations where I just am so disappointed at myself. And, and the, the inward anger and, and the frustration, then, then it turns to anger at God. It turns into anger to the church. It turned in anger to whoever was preaching. I was just bitter because it was unresolved sin. And that's why I keep saying, guys, God is ready and willing to turn our regret and our shame into our strength. Let me say that again. God is wanting to turn our guilt and shame, and he wants to turn that and give us strength through the guilt and the shame. He wants to use the guilt and the shame toward for repentance, right? He, he, 
He wants us to renew our hearts and mind and be like, you know what? I'm a new person now. And this is how you combat it. This is how you deal with it. It's like, you know what? Yeah, I did do that back in the day. But through God's grace and God's mercy and what he did on the cross, I'm a new dude. That's the mindset you have to have. That's where you have to marinate your mind in uh, Romans 12, 1 and 2. Well, now that's not in your notes, but write that down. Romans 12, 1 and 2. That's where he says you have to renew your mind daily. You have to change your thinking. You have to change your thinking. And so when you go there and you think about the guilt and the shame and the remorse, then you have to be like, but you know what? That was old Bobby. That was, that was my old self. And yes, I did do that. And I, that sucked, but you know what? God forgave me for what I'm thinking. I am a new man in Christ. I am a new creature. He has forgiven me. And now I can live in freedom. That's why I found that picture on the backside of your notes where the guy's breaking free. You're a new dude. So obviously we can't forget what we've done in the past, but we can use our past and our, the, the shame to now give glory to God saying, yeah, but he paid for that sin on the cross and I'm a new man. What power does Satan have then when you start having that mindset? What power does Satan have when you say, that was, that was old me and now I've given my life to Christ? Satan is defeated at that point. So that's why we memorize scripture. That's why I say, guys, write down Romans 12, 1 and 2. He, he, God is willing and able and, and able to take your, your regret and, your, and your, your, your past and use it for his glory. What did I put here? This looks good. We live our lives of private defeat, but God wants to renew our hearts and minds, and he wants to send us into his world as lights shining in the darkness. I don't know where I copied and pasted that quote from, but that's phenomenal. He wants to use us as lights in a shining, uh, to shine for him in a dark world. Like Peter, Peter was able to overcome. David was able to overcome. Adam and Eve was able to overcome. And that's where when we change our thought process, men, and we change, which is Romans 12, 1 and 2, talks about where we are a different dude. We are a different, our, our minds have changed. And we use our defeat for God's glory. All right, I'm close to landing the plane here. Hang with me. I'm almost done. Then we're going to go to table time. I put here in my notes, I already talked about this, that God, God ha does have a purpose for the, for the guilt um, that we have in our life. So the guilt and shame you have in your life, God can use that. He wants us to lead us to repentance so it can be washed away. Satan totally, all he wants to do is discourage us men. He wants to think that we're hopeless. He wants to make sure we're debilitated. Um, and Satan wants you to be like, what's the use? What's the use? Why should I continue to pursue the Lord? And that's the hook that he uses for all of us. And we have to be aware of that hook. So in your notes there, I have all kinds of things. Uh, I, I found that one, uh, the four steps from, from freedom to guilt and shame. I found that from Vibrant Christian Living, where it gives us four four principles, four ideas to help us take the guilt and the shame. And how do we twist that and become a new man and, and to, to combat Satan with all his junk that he, he throws our way? Number one is to ask God to help you clarify uh, where, where is the guilt and the shame coming from? Guys, because it's not coming from him. The guilt, when we go to guilt and shame, it's not coming from God. It's coming from the enemy. He constantly wants to uh, just to remind us of our past. Number two, uh, separate the conviction from the condemnation. That's where it's like you have to sink your teeth into, I've been forgiven. That is my old self. That is my, what I did back in the day. And, and know that God has uh, redeemed us, and he is, he is gentle with us, like he was with Peter on the Sea, on the, the sea of Galilee when, when Peter talks with Christ again after what Peter did. And, and, and Christ is gentle, and Christ wants to restore you. Number three, it says, learn from the conviction and restate the condemnation, and, and talking about how remember that God can use our feelings of guilt and shame for a good purpose. And then the fourth one they said is talks about let go of the guilt and shame and walk on. And I wrote in there in parentheses, very difficult to do. That was not in there 
in, in, in what they have, but that is very difficult, but that's why we practice men. That's why we come here is we have to move on. We have to walk forward and, and to combat the enemy with, with, uh, scripture and knowing that, Hey, I'm a new, I'm a new dude. I want to land the plane. How are we doing on time? I want to land the plane on Romans eight, one. And I asked Jim to eight, actually it's eight, one and two. I want to read this as a group. It's kind of long, but I want to read this. This is what I need you to hang your hat on, men. I need you to hang your hat on Romans 8, 1 and 2 of what Christ has done for us. This is taken from the Message Bible. Uh, Your version uh, in your Bible may be different, but I just loved how the Message Bible talks about what Jesus has done, what our past is like, and and what, what this verse really talks about. So let's read this as a group and, and, and mark this in your notes and, and reread it this afternoon, reread it tomorrow, reread it next week. Romans 8 verses 1 and 2. Here we go as a group. With the arrival of Jesus, the Messiah, the faithful dilemma is resolved. Those who have entered into Christ being here for us no longer have to live on the continuous low-lying black cloud. A new power is in operation. The spirit of life in Christ, like a strong wind, has magnificently cleared the air, freeing you from a fatal lifetime of brutal tyranny at the hands of sin and death. That is the epitome of this entire lesson. This entire lesson, men, is based on that. And that's why it's like, guys, why why do we study God's word? Why do we come together? We come together because when Satan dangles that hook out there and we want to we want to bite that hook and swim and go, Jesus says, Man, I have forgiven you. I need you to <clears throat> I need you to move on and, and not live under the continuous low-lying black cloud of your past. Talk to my brother about this. I said, Man, I need prayer because this is a difficult, this is difficult because some men are just like, I can't, I, I can't forgive myself. And this is what Barry said. When we don't forgive ourselves, this is, it's the epitome of you saying, God, what you did on the cross was not good enough. Let me, let me say that again. When you're, when you're thinking and you're thinking, man, my past, what I did, I jacked up. I can't, I can't forgive myself. Ultimately, what you're saying is, God, your payment on the cross was just not good enough because I can't forgive myself. And this is what Barry told me last week or this week. He says, it's us basically going into a jail cell and sitting there with the gates open and the warden saying, come out. Visualize that. You go to jail because you're you're sitting there and you're just like, what I did is so wrong. And God is saying, the doors are open. The warden is saying, you have no handcuffs on. Let's go get out of jail. And we're saying, nope, I need to be in jail. And I'm going to sit here while the doors are open. Does that make sense? Do you see that visual? That's what we do. That's what I do. That's what you do. And God's saying, come to me. Like, let's go. We need to move on. Yes, we're going to learn from your past. We're going to learn from that regret. But let's go. Let's be a a light in in a dark world. I appreciate you guys praying for me. This is, this is a hard hook, <clears throat> but it's a hook we all, almost all of us, struggle with is, is guilt and shame and regret and remorse. So I, I pray that this helped you. I pray that this is something you can take and learn from. And we'll move on from this. This is what's hard for me as a, as a leader. I, 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 I go through, I sit in my room and I study and I go through all these notes and I'll start flipping through and I'll be like, oh yeah, I remember this. What's the date on this? This was, uh, oh yeah, January 22nd, 2022. I talked about guilt, shame, and that was the hook. John put together a beautiful uh, a, a, a clip art of this, the hook that we have. I remember that. I, I'm wondering if the guys are, are still learning from that. I'm wondering, or if you guys just put it away and just like, yeah, no. What guys, what are you doing? That's, that's why I love LJ's passion. When he says, guys, wh- why do you drive up to the forum? Why do you walk through these doors? Why are we doing this? We're, we're doing this, men, because we got to train to follow Jesus. We're not here to talk about sports. I could talk sports all day long. I love it. 
but it's useless. It's not good. We can talk work. We can sit around and, and do that. Oh, the stock market. How about politics? Let's go there. All that stuff doesn't matter. What matters is there's a hook out there. That's what matters. There's a hook out there and Satan wants to jack you up. And that's why we come. And we're like, guys, come on, man. We got to come together. Guys on Zoom, man, thank you for your commitment to, to logging in. There's tons of distractions on Zoom. There's tons of distractions in here. But guys, we got to come together. We got to study God's word. That's why I load you up with all kinds of scripture because the scripture is powerful. That's, that's, that's our playbook. This is our training. We, we call it practice. We say, guys, we got to train. We got to train to follow Jesus. Well, here's our playbook. We got to study it. So I've given you a bunch of scriptures. What are you going to do with it? What are you going to do with it? Sink your teeth into Romans 8, 1 and 2. I only put two questions on here for your, for your table. Is guilt, shame, and regret robbing you of life right now? Is it robbing you? Are you sitting in that jail cell with the doors wide open and you're like, nope, uh, I can't leave because it was so bad what I did. It was so bad what I did. And God's saying, man, the doors are wide open. I have forgiven you. Let's go. Let's get out. Is, is that robbing you? Are you quickly angered, frustrated, and, and the root of the issue is the guilt, shame, and, and regret? So how can the men of practice support you and encourage you? And then the second questionnaire is your relationship with God currently limited by, by the, those feelings of guilt, shame, and remorse, or regret, I should say. And then someone in your, at your table needs to read Galatians 5, verse 1. All right, man, here's the most important part of practice is where we get together in groups. Lots of vulnerability opportunity, lots of transparent opportunity for you to share with the guys. And you have that, that opportunity to be vulnerable and be transparent, or you can suppress it. I know what that's like for years and years, man. I, I was all good, man. I was all good. I had no, I, I, I love Jesus. I was saved when I was 10 but I was so fake in my walk with Christ. And so like, yeah, I, I'm, all, I'm all good. I, I was raised in a Christian home, met my wife at a Christian college in LA. I've been in church all my life. I'm good. I'm good. Inside, I was a mess, absolute mess. And until I got real and until I surrendered, then God started to change Bobby Bandera's heart and life. And now I say I use my mess for ministry. I'm not perfect, guys. I'm, up, I'm, I'm one of you. I'm not a pastor. I work for Johnson Controls, and I'm in sales and marketing. I'm a regular cat just like you, but God has put men on my heart to be like, man, I, I'm, 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 I want to help these men who are just so hurting and, and lost because they have so much guilt, shame, and remorse, and just they're fake, and they just don't want to be real. And so as long as I've, I've said this before, as long as it's on my watch, as long as I'm the leader, I'm just going to push and push and push and be like, come on, men, just be real with each other. We need a savior. We need to be forgiven. We need to, we need to see that hook. We need to see that lure of Satan and run the other way and be like, no, no, no. I've learned about this. I've learned about how God has forgiven me of my past. And I'm going to use my past. I'm going to use my mess for ministry now. And that's what you guys need to do. I'm using my mess of my marriage and my career and my finances from 2000, from pretty much 2000 to 2010, where I was just wasting away, doing nothing. And then Christ was like, okay, yeah, now you finally surrender, Bobby. Now I want to use you. I didn't know I was going to do this. I didn't know I was going to be the leader of practice. But God was like, yeah, I'm going to use you. You're going you're gonna to use your mess for ministry now. And that's what he wants to do with you, men. He wants to use your mess for ministry. Will you do it? We good? Let's pray. And then we'll go to table time. Father, thank you for, thank you for your word. Thank you for we can go to all these passages in the Bible and, and learn about our adversary. We can learn about how he, he prowls around. How We can learn about the hooks and the lures and the distractions that our enemy gives us to, to jack us up. But Lord, on the contrary, then we can also learn 
and, and, and see that in Romans 8, verses 1 and 2, we have, we have no condemnation for, thus, for those of us who have given our life to you. There's no scoreboard, Lord. There's the, the, the scoreboard is, says zero, and, 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 and you're not holding that against us because you have forgiven us. Lord, and you want to use our mess for ministry. Lord, you want to use a, a bright light uh, when we reflect you to go into a dark workplace, maybe even a dark home, a, a dark neighborhood, a, a dark soul. And, and you want to use us. So, Father, I pray that these men here can recognize the hook of of the guilt and our past and the shame and just regret. And and now we can flip it and be like, yeah, I I did do that. But Lord, I'm yours now and you have forgiven me. I've left that jail cell because the gates are wide open to freedom, forgiveness, restoration. So thank you. Thank you, Lord. Lord, bring us back safely next week as we look at another hook, another, another lure that Satan dangles out in front of us to where we can see the hook and run the other way and run to you. We love you, Lord. I lift up all the men's groups that, that are meeting throughout, shoot, Arizona, the United States, all the men's groups that are, are meeting. I pray that they are growing and that men would grow closer to you. Protect us, Lord. Bring us back next week. In your name I pray. Amen. All right, guys, go to your table. Uh, those guys here, if you could just use the table, go four or five guys and uh, go hard till 8.30. Prayer team is going to meet up afterwards uh, up here in the front. And uh, if you need prayer, come join them. And we'll be back here next week at 7 o'clock. Love you guys. Have a great week.